So I'm going to move to a very different question about migration. Here, what we want to do, this is a joint paper with, with a, lo a lot of people, but basically what we want to do is to understand the impact of a program that regularized migrants. And we want to understand what was the impact of that, that program on their lives. That's basically what we want to do. And we all know that economic migration, and especially forced migration, economic migration is quite persistent, and forced migration is on the rise. And it's becoming really an important economic issue, but mostly a political issue. Uh, so we want to understand how to better integrate migrants into the societies, into the destination countries where they arrive. And when we see what's happening with forced displacement, what we see is that there is really a huge increase in, in forced displacement, in forced migration. It has been driven by three countries, mostly, before Colombia was there, but only with internal displacement. And what we see is that it has uh, increased significantly. It has more than doubled during the last two decades. We have had three recent crises, the Ukrainian one, which is, which is ongoing at the moment, about six million people that have been forced to migrate from Ukraine to uh, European countries. We have the Syrian crisis and we have the Venezuelan crisis, which is really large with respect to, the, to this hemisphere. And one of the main questions is how do we address the arrival of forced migrants in the destination countries? And one of the main questions specifically is whether migrants are allowed to work, whether when they arrive to their destination countries, whether they are allowed to work. And this is a hugely difficult political issue. Because some people, basically some politicians, this say that we should not allow migrants to work. Countries should not allow forced migrants to work because they are going to compete with locals and they are going to decrease the conditions, labor outcomes for locals. However, migrants always have to work and they have to generate income. So in many cases, oftentimes, migrants do work. And basically what they do is that they compete with vo the vulnerable populations in the destination countries. So what we want to understand is what happens in a country where migrants are allowed to work and are provided rights very similar to the citizens uh, of the country where, in which they arrive. There is already some literature, nascent literature on how to support refugees. Most of this literature focuses on humanitarian assistance, focuses on cash transfers. What is the impact of providing cash transfers to forced migrants? Shelter programs, and there is some, some new work on mental health problems. But there is little evidence on how to integrate migrants into society, such that they can be self-reliant, such that they can generate their own income and integrate into the society. Something that is very important for you to bear in mind is that migrants, forced migrants, seldom return to their, to their origin countries. Most stay in the country where they arrive. It's about like 3% when you look at the statistics. So what we do in this paper, as I say, is that we want to understand whether providing an amnesty to migrants, a regularization program to migrants, helps them become more self-reliant. This is basically what we do. Uh, and basically what we do is that we look at a very large amnesty program that was implemented here in Colombia in 2018. And it was an amnesty that provided the legal right to work in any sector and it provided access to social services, and it provided free mobility to migrants within the countries. You may think that this is obvious, but in many countries this is not the case for refugees. And we identify it in many dimensions. We identify it for well-being, consumption, labor income. We identify it for health status, and we identify what is the impact on other outcomes, uh, uh, labor outcomes. There is some evidence already on this topic, but most of the literature is on developed countries. And what is the impact of this amnesty program on labor markets for the natives? So what is the effect for the local population to provide the legal right to work to irregular migrants? There is also some literature showing what is the impact on local crime rates, something similar to what Marieke was presenting. And there are two papers that estimate also the effect of these amnesty programs on native workers on developing countries, one for Jordan and another one for Colombia, one that we did with Dani Bajar and Sandra Rosso. What is the contribution of our paper? The first contribution is that really we are studying this in a developing country where labor markets are, uh, have high informality rates, so migrants can work 
regardless of what is the regulation in the country. And this is actually what happens. We are also looking at comprehensive life outcomes. We are not just focusing on labor markets, but we are trying to understand other effects. And something that is very important is that we are taking advantage of this program that was implemented here in Colombia. It was large, but most importantly for the empirical strategy for identifying the causal effects is that uh, the program was sudden and it was nobody knew about it. So there are no anticipation effects here, which is very important for identifying the effect. A fourth thing about this program is that there was no eligibility criteria. So for example, in Jordan, there was a similar program, but migrants could only work in sectors where Jordanians were not working so much. No? So here they can work wherever they want. Um, let me provide you a little bit with the context of this program. It's called Permiso Especial de Permanencia. And it's mostly and only for Venezuelan migrants. So as many of you know, Venezuela has gone through a very difficult crisis, economic, political, and social crisis during the last decade. And this has prompted the migration of a large number of Venezuelans. At the moment, it's about 5 million. This is the largest outflow of migrants in this hemisphere during the last 50 years, so it's quite large. And what has been very different from other types of migrations is that it has been to the region, to many countries in the regions, mostly to Colombia, because it's the first country where they can arrive. So migration costs are much lower. So right now we have in Colombia about 1.7 and 2 million uh, Venezuelan migrants. Most of these migrants and at that moment were irregular migrants. They were either, they were irregular either because they illegally crossed the frontier, which is not difficult really, and because they over, or because they overstayed their visa. How did the program work? And this is very important for the empirical strategy and for the identification strategy. In 2018, we had, as I said, about 1.7 million Venezuelan migrants, and the government of Colombia decided to do a census of irregular migrants. The purpose of the census was not to regularize them. The purpose of the census was to collect information on their characteristics and to understand where they were located and what were their needs. So they arrived and they started to do the census in April and they did it through June 8th, starting, and it was quite difficult because they had to identify where the migrants were located. They were irregular. They had a lot of fears of being census. Uh, and so here you have an important thing is that there is some selection there, no? Because migrants were fearful of registering because maybe they could be deported. However, the census registered about 400,000 households. 64, ah, no, and then what is very important for the program, in August 2, the Colombian government decided to provide regularization to all the migrants that were in the census. This was a surprise, nobody knew. So the, the president of Colombia says that all the people that were in the, in the RAM could, were eligible for regularization. And the regularization process was quite easy. They just could, had to go online and provide some information and they were given a number saying that they were regularized. About 64% of them regularized. And basically what we're doing is that we are uh, leveraging this surprise factor uh, at least to control for anticipation effects. What did the program include? It was a program for two years a legal migratory status, as I say, work permit, whatever they wanted to work, provided that they were offered work, of course, but they could work in any sector in any city of the country, and they had access to health, education, and childcare services, and to government transfers during COVID, that was very important. And it was like an ID, so they could uh, register in private services, very importantly, they could have a bank account, and they could use financial products. The government of Colombia in 2001 did a more, a bigger one, uh, and they were regularized all the migrants that are here in Colombia right now. This means regularizing about 2 million people uh, for 10 years. No? But we are just concentrating on this one. How do we design the study? This is important. When we arrived to do the study, the program, as I say, was a surprise. So we did not have a baseline. We were not able to collect information on how were the migrants before 
the, migrant, the, the program started. So that's a big challenge that we have. We did a survey, but uh, actually right now it's a panel survey. We have two waves of the survey, but today I'm just going to concentrate on the first wave of the survey. And the main challenge was to find a control group of irregular migrants to be able to compare it with the treatment group. Uh, for the eligible migrants, we had access to the RAM census. We have contact information for all the migrants, so we were able to get a random sample of all the RAM migrants and then apply the survey to those RAM, RAM migrants. And for the control group, we uh, asked referrals from the RAM uh, people and also databases from refugee organizations. We had a list and again we did a random sample of that and we applied the survey. Very importantly, we were careful to have migrants that were, had arrived in the same time period because we didn't want to have a time effects there. So that all the migrants that we have are from January 17 till 2008, December 2018. So we did, before doing the survey, we inquired when they had arrived. because you were not registered in RAM. That's the only reasons where you were, and that may happen, and that's very important, Raquel, because that may happen because you arrived there after the RAM was closed, or because you basically did not register, and that's important. And we are going to exploit those two things. Uh, we did a survey collection in all these cities. We have this, the survey is representative of big cities and small cities. Uh, when we were going to do the survey, COVID started, so we had to do it by phone. <laughs> it was quite a challenge, but we were able to uh, do the survey. About 2,200 uh, families, 50-50 between uh, RAM and non-RAM, between regularized and non-regularized one, or RAM and non-RAM, because we have intention to treat as well. Uh, we did also qualitative surveys because we really wanted to understand the process through which they decided to register in RAM and the process through which they decided to uh, register to become eligible because that's an important uh, self-selection that we have there. And so the survey contains a lot of questions about the previous conditions before all that happened, so that, such that we could control for that. So that's important. What is the empirical strategy? What we're doing uh, is that we are basically exploiting the time, the timeline. So what we're going to do is a regression discontinuity design where we are going to compare migrants just right before uh, RAM closed and right after RAM closed. No? So the, the, big, the main difference is that these migrants arrived after RAM was closed, so they could not register in RAM, basically. That's the difference that we're going to exploit. We also do intention to treat because we have a, a sample of households that register in RAM but never register as PIP. No? But here I'm just going to present you the results for the uh, empirical, for the regression discontinuity. This is the timeline. I already talked a little bit about the timeline. So this is the regression discontinuity that we do. It's a fuzzy uh, RDD. And what we do is, as I say, exploit this date when the RAM closes. So all that people that arrive after RAM closed, they were not able to register because RAM was already closed, so they could not basically register, uh, apply to the PEP program. And the ones that arrived before, they could, okay? So we're going to compare these, these two. This is again exactly the same, and here I'm just showing you the validity of the local continuity assumption, and we see that we have, uh, we have some problems with just one variable, uh, but so far we see that there is a local continuity here. Let me show you the results. Uh, and what we find, which uh, we really like it, is that the effect of the program is quite sizable, especially for well-being. Let me show you. The increases in, we have an index for well-being, an index for access to state services and to private services as well, for health outcomes and for other labor outcomes. So what we find is that the effect is really large for consumption, for well-being. They have a huge increase in consumption, about 48%. We have an increase in labor income, about 22%, and more employment. Something that is very important is that 
access to state services really increased. No? So here in Colombia, for, for uh, low-income people to be able to get access to state services, they have to register first in CISBEN, which is a mean targeted test. And what we find is that that increases by 56 percentage points. Therefore, they have access to subsidized health care, which is about one third percentage points. At 26 percentage points, sorry, they have access to transfer programs. And when we look at COVID, for example, they were better able to cope with COVID, but I'm not showing you this here. We have an increase in health outcomes, but mostly in physical health outcomes. We don't see an effect on mental health. And what is very interesting is that the increase in labor income is not necessarily because they were more formal. Formalization increased, but we have a problem with the estimate. It's quite noisy. It's, it's very imprecise. So what we do know is that some, the labor conditions improved regardless of whether they were formal or informal. We believe that their bargaining power uh, increased. No? I'm not going to go show you the detailed results, but this is basically what we find. No, we find more consumption, more labor income, the effect of consumption is really large, employment. We have a, a, an important effect on self-reported health status and access to state services and financial products. And when we look at the, at the second wave, this is increasing, this continues to increase. Something again that is important is that you see here, we don't see an effect on formal jobs, but as I say, the, the coefficient is quite imprecise because the number of observations that we have for the regression discontinuity is not large. We do a lot of robustness tests. I'm not going to go into that, but the results hold. When we do intention to treat instead of that, we find the very, very similar results. And also, as I said, we did a qualitative survey. So I just end with these two testimonies. The first one is one of the testimonies that we think is explaining the, largest, the, the large effect on income and unemployment, labor income. And what we think is that these migrants were being exploited when they are irregular, they are exploited. They don't have any bargaining power at all. When they stop being irregular, they have much more bar bargaining power in the labor market. So even though they are not formal, their wages increase. Another important thing that we are exploring at the moment is that they feel much more integrated into society. And they feel much more integrated into society not only because they trust more, for example, Colombia, but most, mostly because they, they trust more to, to approach government institutions, for example, police, and report more crimes. And we're finding something uh, with that. So again, I'm not going to repeat what we find. And what we believe it's important is that first, when we look at what happened with uh, the local labor markets, we don't find any effect of PEP on formal labor markets. We do it for the locals in another paper with Bani Bahar and Sandra. And what we believe is important about this, uh, this program is that when you provide refugees or forced migrants with way to integrate into society, uh, they can become self-reliant uh, instead of just doing humanitarian programs, which is, which is mostly the, the policies that are used to address the needs of, of forced migrants. And I end here. Thank you very much.